عبر مفهوم إدارة المشاريع فكيف تحقق المؤسسات أكبر استفادة من المعرفة المكتسبة في إدارة المشاريع العملاقة لتحسين كفاءتها التشغيلية هذا ما سيحدثنا عنه الدكتور إدوارد هوفمان المدير التنفيذي لقطاع المعرفة بوكالة ناسا الأمريكية دكتور حكيف This is for you, Dr. Habib. al salam alaikum. I've been in Dubai now for one week. It's the first time I've been in Dubai. I had a uh, driver from the airport who was very enthusiastic very proud to be living in Dubai. He was telling me the wonderful things about Dubai. And he asked me within five minutes, how did I like Dubai? And I said, I've been in your taxi for my whole experience. And he said, yes, how do you like? And uh, I looked out, it was beautiful. I can answer now after six days, because now I know. I'm very impressed. I'm very grateful for having been invited to be here. Um, there's outstanding leadership vision for the future. There's tremendous energy of people, and there's certainly a commitment to innovation and to taking on grand challenges and great projects for society. And someone from NASA appreciates that, grand challenges and vision. So it's an honor to be here, and I will take that wherever I go. In my time with you, I want to focus on one question. And the question is, how can organizations and leaders collaborate through knowledge and through talent to succeed in the most critical projects that society has? There are three things that I'll focus on in terms of offering ideas. One is talent, talent and expertise. How do we develop it? How do we secure it? And more important, how does it continue? The second is how do we deal with social and project entrepreneurship? Talk a little bit about that. And third, how do we focus our societies, organizations and projects on projects that matter. When I was appointed Chief Knowledge Officer a few years ago at NASA, even though I've been at NASA for several decades, I had people asking me in the project in the engineering community, why? Why do we need a Knowledge Officer? And I think the key thing is to understand for the most complex projects, we need the know-how and the know-how comes from collaboration and conversation. And why do we need that? Because the work we do is hard and it's complex. And I'm going to show you a video. And what I'd like you to do as you watch this is I'd like you to think about all the different disciplines and the competencies that it takes for this program to be successful. This will be the International Space Station flying over Earth. As you watch this and hopefully enjoy this, what are the competencies and skills we need in programs and projects to be successful? Because I know that these are the same competencies that are necessary for construction of something like Burj, for nuclear energy, for roads, for programs and projects that we do.
to remind people that I work with for 32 years at NASA that we have to learn, we have to take talent seriously. We can't become complacent because once we believe that we're NASA and we can't fail, then we do fail. But it becomes a challenge because what are the competencies that it takes for our projects to be successful? It takes certainly, and at NASA we will always start, people think about the technology, the technical, the engineering, vital. But we like those problems. We're engineers, we're scientists, so we focus on that. We also have to focus on the business, or what Mark talked about yesterday, the business strategy. Are the projects we're doing of value to our society? Can we get the funding that we need? Can we continue with the, the funding? Do we know where the, the dollars are going in the schedule? But I'll tell you a, a secret, is that the number one reason when we fail is because of third risk, and it has to do with social risk. See, when our projects are successful, it's because people have come together to be effective, to be successful, and to share, and to exchange, and to constantly adapt. And the times we've had failures, and you've probably read in school about our different failures, whether it's Challenger, or Columbia, or Hubble, it's always been about, we haven't worked effectively as a team. This isn't easy because in a project age, while we think about a lot of the factors, the number one thing that I think is essential about programs and projects is that it is hundreds of disciplines having to come together to synergize, to share, to be expert together, to be effective. And if there's an environment of, I'll share with you later, we run into, we run into trouble. I'm a big fan of an Argentinian author, George Luis Borgia. And I was familiar with many of his stories, but I wasn't with this one, the Library of Babel. And strangely, as these things happen, four years ago when I was appointed the NASA Chief Knowledge Officer to deal with issues of learning and sharing and being successful in our programs and projects, as things happen, I came upon this story. And the Library of Babel is a very short story. It's about a land, a world, where all the answers are available in the rooms, through books, through expertise. And the solutions are there, but there's one problem. And you know what the problem is. In this society, they can't find the answers to the questions they're looking for. It's not available. They can't find it because it's dispersed, because it's written down. There's a rumor that there's a person who has all the answers. They can't find the answers. And our programs and projects are very complex. And so we need to be able to find these answers, and it's usually through people coming together. As, at events like this, where we can share, we can understand, where we can find the sources. The number one questions I get from young professionals who join NASA is who do I speak to who has expertise in name the area, or where do I find it? Because they often find themselves in a simulated library of Babel, where they know the answers are there, and we tell them the answers are there, but they have trouble finding it. A little bit about knowledge. I had an experience of knowledge this week. I, I mentioned the last Thursday, I was talking at a knowledge management event in the financial center of Dubai. Many of the same issues being discussed from a knowledge perspective. I had Friday free. And so at the end of my talk, a person I consider a friend now came up, said, wonderful talk, you, what, what are you going to do in Dubai? And I said, what would you recommend? He said, what would you like? I said that my dream would be to, to do a desert safari. That would be wonderful. He got on his phone, his cell phone. He called a friend. Got off the phone and says, you know, this is the best place to do it. He then got on his phone and clicked things and he says, I'm sending you the link. Then he called another friend and he said, this is the time frame, this is the one to do. Now I came here for months knowing, and I got guidebooks. And they're good guidebooks, they have information. But the guidebook didn't have any of that in it. Knowledge is profoundly social. 
and a social from the standpoint of when I come to Dubai for the first time, if I know people, if I know people who live here, they know the things to do. That's the same thing with a project. There are people who have done it, who have experienced it, and they can tell you, and they can mentor you, and they can be successful, and that's what we emphasize. And it's not that the guidebooks are not good. We need guidebooks, because it gives a sense. But it's not as time-specific, it's not as local, it's not as effective. Knowledge is generational. Every project, this is one of the key things that I talk to folk, that are people who are starting projects. When someone's young, they start a program or a project at NASA, they're working the new launch vehicle, they're working the new Hubble telescope, they're working uh, the new Mars mission. They want to start fresh. They tell me, Ed, we don't want to be influenced by what came before because we're going to be better. I said you can be better, but you have to learn what came before because what came before will influence success things, successful practices we need to use. And if we don't learn from what came from the past, we're going to repeat mistakes. And when that happens, you read about them in the newspapers and we look foolish. Knowledge is generational. One project is impacted by everything that came before and will impact everything that came after it. That's a heavy burden because we have to constantly learn. We're in a different world, and what I would say about this is one of the challenges is the greatest challenge, I would say, in terms of missions and programs of complexity is collaboration and convening the conversation. And that's what's changed in the world with technologies, with the ability to travel places, with the ability to network and to talk. It's collaboration. People ask me what's the most important tools for being effective in terms of projects. One is communities. Who knows better about project management, the successes, the mistakes, than project managers? People will sometimes ask me, Ed, what do you recommend for our organization? I say I don't know. I can say what I know for NASA, but what I do at NASA is I ask the practitioners in battery technology, in engineering, in project management, what they know. Same thing at Dubai, you have your expertise, you have to learn from each other. But it's about convening the conversation. Our most successful project leaders aren't the smartest ones who have the answers. They are often the ones that are most dangerous because if they think they have to have the answers, they'll almost eventually be wrong. There are people who will get on the phone, talk to their partners, talk to industry, talk to their collaborators and get the answers. Keep in mind in the world that we live in at NASA, 90% of our work is done through industry and hundreds of industry organizations working together. 80% of our projects are international collaborations. I saw three weeks ago NASA signed an agreement with the UAE space for um, bilateral uh, cooperation. So we'll work together and we, we have to learn from each other. That's the essential ingredient in terms of programs and projects and that's the most important lesson when someone joins NASA. I have to get them to understand we didn't hire you because you're brilliant and you have all the answers. We want you to have answers. But we have to hire you to collaborate and to be able to work with others. Communities, collaboration, technologies, telling the story in terms of what are the issues these are the factors that lead to success. We're in a project world with entrepreneurship rising. Project world with entrepreneurship rising. They go together, in my view. I get people, whenever I get together with my colleagues who are project-based, people tell me the doom of project management. Project management's going to go away. There's a new way to do it. It's faster, it's leaner, it's this, it's that. We're only going to Mars by effective project management. We deal with issues in terms of construction through project management. We deal with health issues in terms of project management because we need that expertise, the discipline, the skills. But there is entrepreneurship and we need to find ways to get better at how we do our projects. If we think about organizations like Uber, how they've changed the field of getting driven around, Airbnb, how they changed the hotel industry, or Google, or development ops, 
and things like that. These aren't, from my standpoint, things that replace project management. These are things that we need to consider. How do we get better? How do we innovate? We're in an environment of permanent data, constant testing, and this is natural to a project age where we can incorporate and change and have to buy you demonstrate that. There's constant innovation, there's constant change. Before I got here, people told me the thing that's amazing about Dubai is that if you only show up once a year, it's always different. That's the world. It's innovation, it goes together with project management, it goes together with entrepreneurship. So it's a project world because of these challenges, and it's an entrepreneurial world, and they fit together and they go together. Project management is there because the world is complex in our, in our projects. The typical NASA projects has hundreds of disciplines coming together. When you look at the International Space Station, that's a program of 21 different nations talking different language, different customs. They eat on the space station. One of the early issues was who eats, what's the food? The nation said, if you're an astronaut, you eat your own food. When the astronauts you know, started living in the space station, they didn't do that. They started eating other people's food. They had to change the regulation, they changed the requirements. It's a complex world. It's a world of talent, it's the world extensively needing sharing, and it's about communities, and it's about leadership and vision. We also get directions from leadership. NASA is a government agency. Most of the hundred or so space agencies around the world are guided by a government. And three focusing points we receive is the need for better integration. More of a formal approach to being effective at projects and at knowledge and a program that's sustainable. And sustainable drives a lot of the factors that we have in place. So we've talked about it being a project world of great challenges. We have to do a lot of things right to be successful. We can do a thousand things right, and if one thing is missed, it can lead to an explosion, a failure. So there's a lot of pressures. This is something that requires project management, systems in, in engineering, integration, a perspective at a systems level. So how do we approach this? So from within NASA, what we've tried to do is one, we use governance and policy, not to replace individual expertise or thinking, but to supplement that. We write down, how do we do risk management? How do we do costing? How do we approach lessons learned for projects? Project managers always say they're too busy to do lessons learned. No, we have to do lessons learned. Not only for the project, but for the hundreds of other projects coming after it. We need to be able to, to leverage that. We also have to have ways of accessing leadership. My management, I have a wonderful leadership. And one of the ways I know that is they ask me, Ed, what's the most important thing we need to do to develop our talent? What's the most important thing we need to do projects right? And I will tell them there's many things. Frankly, there's hundreds of things we have to do. But the most important thing is leadership access. One of the things I'm most impressed by here in Dubai, your leaders are here, your Easy. leaders are talking, your leaders are teachers, your leaders have a vision. If you have a vision, it creates the engagement, the energy, people are excited. I had a driver, like I said, who was talking about the excitement of living in, in Dubai. And that's partly because of the vision that was, was playing out there. Our governance at NASA talks about the roles we play, not just for the practitioners, but for our leaders. We decided that as chief knowledge officer for programs in engineering, that I reside, I report to the chief engineer at NASA. It's a very senior position. Chief engineer is responsible for the guidelines and the oversight of all the missions that we do, for the advanced technologies for the learning, reports directly to, to our leader. We set up a policy before a new chief engineer came on board. I said, I'll be working closely with you. He said, oh, why? I said, because although I'm the chief knowledge officer, knowledge flows through the engineering leadership and the program leadership. Without saying anything else, a week later when they set up the new organization chart, he communicated to everyone, this is the engineering organization and there's a dotted line of the chief knowledge officer to me, 
because in our policy, in our governance, in the way we value working together, knowledge is essential for our mission. I didn't have to say anything. That's the power of governance. That's the power of policy. Once in a while, I get people in engineering and the projects telling me, why do we need all this paper? We need paper because things change and people want to be able to understand how do we approach things. If we want to change that, that's appropriate. So governance is vital about the roles and how we work together. Another thing that I say that's vital is benchmarking. I knew that I didn't have all of the answers when I became the chief knowledge officer. I knew that 25 years earlier when NASA after the challenger said, we want you to establish a program project management academy. I didn't have the expertise or the background, but what I did know is I can go to friends and I can go to colleagues. One of the important practices I would strongly recommend is that of benchmarking. I go to industry partners, I go to organizations. I've had people say, why are you in Dubai talking here? Because, well, hopefully you learn something from me. I'm learning a lot from you about leadership, about vision, about change, about engagement, about learning, and I take that back to NASA. I've spent this year, just this year, 2015, meeting with over 50 organizations because of the importance of learning from what's happening. And I typically ask two questions. One is how do you deal with your challenges and projects? And what are the best things that you do? Different organizations, whether it's Boeing, whether it's Merck and Pharmaceutical, whether it's oil and gas, whether it's government, they have best practices. They often are things that can be, be used. I also focus extensively on the engineers. I spend a lot of time at NASA and I'll go to each of the centers and I'll say, what's working? What are we doing wrong? I meet with the senior leadership two times a year. If you tell me, we can address it. If you don't tell me, it doesn't change. And you'll see that I'm a big believer of the associations. This I learned from 26 years ago when I started up the academy. The first thing I did there pretty much was go to the project manager institute and said, how can you help me? Because again, I didn't know. And the best thing about associations or events like this is you meet people. They can't give you the answers because it's all tailored. But you can meet people in organizations and you can get smart fast. Smart to buy, I like that. I believe in that. So associations, we have an international project management community, a knowledge community. It's about 12 different countries. Uh, and space agencies around the world, the European Space Agency, Japan, Argentina, India, Brazil. Perhaps you and me would want to be a part of that. We get together at least two times a year. We always talk about what are we doing, how do we share. Uh, and it's focused usually about the development of talent. Because innovation <laughs> is about engagement, people being interested in a great vision in terms of what we're trying to do. Grand challenges, great projects, but it's also about accelerated learning and experimentation. Can we learn from each other and can we move forward? Another thing that's important to do is strategy. We set up when we first got together with the community, there was a skepticism within NASA. Why are we starting up another office? And we like you as the director of the NASA Academy. Why don't you keep doing that? You know, why do we need it? Because things are getting harder, things are getting faster, change is happening. And so we have to go beyond, we have to look for new ways, just like water needs to be reflect, refreshed by a new time. And when we got together, we had to talk about what are our approaches. Well, we don't have enough information. We never have enough information, but we know what the issues and the challenges, at least at NASA, are. When we talk to our young professionals, and these are folks who just joined NASA, Every single one of them, if you ask them what's the greatest weakness of finding answers to their project and engineering problems, they will tell you we are awful at finding things and searching through technology. It's a major, it's a major weakness. Partly because we're an organization of about 60 years. People stay, I'm, I'm there 32 years. Uh, I have a lot of white hair. Um, I fit in with the organization. We stick around so we know people, we know our colleagues, we can talk to folks. 
right? We can go to industry, we can go to our partners, we can go to universities, but if you start an organization, you don't have that network. And so finding things is very important. So one of the things is how do we search? How do we use the internet? How do we use visualization of information to make it easier to find? Second category is communications and sharing. This is vital for us to have a culture of openness and exchange. We fail because we have not done that right in different cases. We have a focus also on how do we go about identifying best practices from within NASA and outside, and we look for ways to measure and to just get better. We have roles in terms of knowledge. My role is basically not to be a boss. No one would listen to me from that standpoint at NASA. The power is at the project level. But I'm there to be a facilitator. I'm there to be someone who catalyzes and advocates for the project and the engineering workforce. And I'm someone who's there who looks to convene the conversation. Let's talk about this. Why is this working? Why is this not? As an example, aerospace has had a series of launch failures over the last year and a half from both commercial entities like SpaceX, Orbital Sciences, Branson's group, as well as space agencies. We want to know why. So we'll be getting together, we'll be talking to colleagues. Why have launches failed? And also, what do we know about those that have been successful? We'll have a forum in 2016. We'll try to learn from that. So it's a catalyst and an advocate for improvement and for change. At NASA, it's very important to value the local culture. We have a couple of hundred projects. They are all somewhat different because they have all different you know, different, slightly different challenges. And so I promised when I was appointed that I would ensure the autonomy. The answers come from the project management community, not from Ed Hoffman in Washington. 90% of the things we do in terms of learning and knowledge happens at the project level. But then there is a responsibility across NASA for collaboration and for openness and for honesty and for sharing. Concept. I've been on mishap boards before, but the one that I chaired was probably the strangest for me because it, it seemed absolutely trivial. It was NOAA and Prime. The spacecraft fell over. The spacecraft fell over because the team didn't put any bolts to hold the spacecraft down. So when they started tipping it, it kept on going. Um, and uh, you know, that's, I mean, what could be simpler to figure out, right? Well, it turned out it wasn't so simple because it was a whole bunch of little things, a whole sequence of things that uh, many organizations, that the, the contractor did, that the government inspectors did, that NASA did, saying, well, this is a good organization. They know what they're doing. They don't have to worry about this. And it all stacked up to the end where it said to the, to the uh, people doing the work, configure the cart appropriately, OK? And it told the inspectors, to make sure that the cart was configured appropriately. Well, okay, now if you put a new <coughs> team together and a new, new uh, inspector together and you put them on a tight time schedule, how do they know what configured appropriately means? So again, leadership access and communication. This is Chris Galise, one of our senior leaders, led many of our Earth Science missions. He's currently the center director of one of our lead centers, Goddard. He served as NASA Administrator, served as the Associate Administrator, most senior for programs in engineering, and he was the Chief Engineer. One of the things that I told him as I was hearing when I spoke to the workforce is that people said, NASA's not a place where we openly talk about our failures. And I would say, well, yeah, we do. Here's, and they, they didn't believe it. So we do a thing, and you can find this. You can search this. You can do a Google search. You can go on YouTube and write down NASA masters with masters and you'll see hundreds of thousands of clips of leaders talking about different things one of the things we ask people to do is to talk about failures and mistakes what he's talking about here was a weather satellite that was on the ground that was improperly bolted in many factors there there's a whole case study you can read it fell over it cost us over 200 million u.s dollars of loss now, we can approach that different ways, but one of the things we need to do is talk about it honestly. And I heard people in the room, and I hear this when they see this clip at NASA, 
the initial reaction is, wow, we're talking honestly. Leaders are talking honestly about an embarrassing failure. So we learn from this by lining up leaders. I had a young professional a few years ago came up to me and said, uh, Dr. Hoffman, how are you successful at NASA? I started giving a typical answer of training. She said, no, no, no. She says, you know, I Googled that. I have all the information. But how are you really successful here? And I said, what do you mean? She said, I see people I work with, some who are engaged, they're happy, they've had a wonderful career, they're, they're, they're doing it. I see other people who seem to be equally smart, but they don't seem to be as happy, they're not as engaged. I said, I hear what you're saying. I started then a series of studies or interviews with hundreds of people across NASA and outside who asked the same question. How are you successful here? Collected basically hundreds of anecdotes and stories came down to the four A's. So what does success look like in a career at NASA? One, assignments. 90% of expertise comes from hands-on work. Knowledge is about doing, knowledge is about talking together, knowledge is about sharing the problems and the successes, but ultimately it's about working on things. When we want people to be successful, we move them around the organization. Knowledge is expensive for us but we move people, we get them the hands-on experiences. If they're not getting the right assignments on projects, things I recommend is, and I've heard this here, setting up an academy. <coughs> people need to get a sense that they're being trained, that they're being educated, that they're learning, and we expend a lot in terms of creating that competency and that capability, and you can learn about this at km.nasa.gov. We have a lot of <laughs> expertise in terms of those kinds of activities. The third A, alliances. Alliances, I think, are like smart Dubai. It's the notion of networks. We're better when we're together. We spend a lot of time putting our people into situations where we meet each other. We'll have forums and events, uh, not quite this large, but where people come together. Our training and learning is really geared around getting people to work together. As an example, 80% of our programs are international partnerships. When I spoke to the space partners, one of the things that their project people say is, it'd be better if we had a course around international collaboration. So we developed that. We conducted two times a year. 50% of the people are there from within NASA. 50% are from our international partners. They're project people. They like the course, but the most thing that they like is that they learn together. And therefore, when they work together, they will have those networks, those alliances to talk to each other. They establish friendships. That's essential for a career. And then the fourth day is attitude. The thing that will end a career at NASA is if you cannot work with other people. 90% of work is done through industry, 80% through international partnerships, and all of our work is done for science, which is university. So it's working with people from all different parts of the organization. It has to be an attitude of respect, of openness, of sharing, of inclusion. I'm going to show you a clip of Brian O'Connor, another senior leader, recently retired from NASA. Brian was a space shuttle astronaut. He led the space shuttle program for many years, and he led our safety organization after the Columbia uh, disaster. And he was a member. He was in the room for the Challenger as a young engineer. And he talks about the importance of speaking up at our programs. Because he said he went into the room, and he was intimidated, he looked at all the great people in the room, and he, there were things he was concerned about, but he didn't raise it, because he assumed that the talent around the table would raise it. And he learned from that. So here's a little clip, and we play this again to our people. When the Challenger accident happened, the accident board beat us up. The public wrote articles about how we were fooling ourselves about how operational we were. Uh, we had totally underestimated the risk of this operation. And all those things that I kind of sensed at, at some point early on were now being blasted at us by, by the public. Uh, the same public that, that was buying our discussion about how safe this was was now beating us up for how we had fooled ourselves. That was part of why I was feeling different after this accident. Uh, in, in previous accidents, we weren't kidding ourselves about the risk uh, in, in any environment I'd ever operated in. It was, it was a flight test environment, the training for combat, whatever. We kind of knew where we were, what the risk was, 
and and yeah, bad things happen, and that's too bad, and we got to learn from it. But we didn't come out of that thinking, wow, we really underestimated the risk there, like we did after challenging. And so that I think was part of why I felt so bad. And and how how this feeling bad kind of registered itself was, I'm never going to sit in a meeting and allow two people to talk past each other and not say something myself, or, or, or at least talk to them in the hallway afterwards. I, I just can't do that anymore. Again, one of the things I've said, if you remember, one of the things I hope you remember is the challenge we have is around collaboration and conveying the conversation. It's not easy. Our programs are people all around the world, different time zones. When I have a meeting, I have folks from Japan at one time, I have people in Europe at another time, I have people in the United States at different times. Um, how do you converse about things? How do you share information? When we fail and when things go wrong, usually someone has seen something, but they didn't raise it. Maybe they were afraid. Maybe they think somebody else would see the same thing. They didn't want to look foolish. Or maybe we didn't give them a chance to come together and talk, to get our leaders to share what is it that's taking place and how do we approach things. One of the tips to consider is to establish an academy or a learning structure. At NASA, when you join NASA from the first day, we put you into a program called Foundations of Project Management and Systems Engineering because we are a project and a systems engineering organization, and we will show our people failures. Just like the Noah M. Prime, who was on the ground, wasn't bolted in, felt, and I would tell the students there, I know what you're thinking, because what they're thinking is, how did those fools do something like that? Same thing when you read about the challenger failure, how did they do that? And then I have to convince them that if they don't communicate, if they don't converse, if they don't listen and respect each other, if they don't seek out the knowledge, they will have their own failures. It's just too many things that can take place. We have training programs, over 50 within project management. You'll see that it's both entry level novices, it's experts, the next generation of experts in the mid-career, and it's also folks at the senior executive level. You learn as long as you're there and until you leave and frankly probably even beyond. It's about engagement, making sure that people understand our vision, the mission, where we're trying to go. We want them to be excited, we want them to be passionate. And it's about exploration and testing. We want them to learn, we want them to know they don't have the answer, that they need to respect and learn from their colleagues and talk. If we get that, we do that in a variety of ways. We put people into simulate or into real projects for a year hands-on project experience. We put people into conferences where they meet their colleagues. We put them into training, all with the notion of exploring and engaging what's necessary for success. Another tip, we put together a map of how do people learn and where can they find knowledge. This is our knowledge map. This is good for NASA. I would expect for the different organizations in Dubai, it will be different. This is our language. What happens when we try to get effective knowledge services? We do case studies, we tell stories, we bring together people in forums, we do a variety of things about learning. There's a heavy investment in programs and projects and in engineering, uh, and all of these are geared, and we can measure ourselves. We know that we're awful in terms of search. Uh, we're partnering with Google and with others to try to get better, but we're not great at that. We know we're outstanding at things like capturing our stories and at learning together. So there's ways of measuring how we do what we do. If you're interested, most of our stuff is open and it's available. And you can go to km.nasa.gov to see things. I'd also say that we wrote an article called Rapid Engagement Accelerated Learning, Real Knowledge at NASA that PMI did a wonderful job of, uh, of posting. So you can go to PMI NASA Knowledge and you'll find the whole article. It's about 60 pages, which will go into depth in terms of these things. So in my final few moments, what are some of the key issues that I'd like to close with? What is the road ahead? One is, is that our world has changed. It does not mean that project management is going away. But it does mean we need to be able to be adaptive, innovative, and we need to focus on how we develop our talent 
and how we develop the ability to collaborate and work together. It's a virtual world, we work at a distance. It's a world of diversity of disciplines and skills and perspectives, and it's also around smart networks. You can't read that there. We've identified 12 imperatives that, again, you can read about in that article, but we need to get better at how we find our knowledge and how we find our answers. Just like when I came to, to Dubai, I had the individual who recommended different approaches, use technology, but also use people to help me have a wonderful experience on Friday. Uh, talent management, how do we develop capability? Greatest challenge for our people is how can they constantly learn in a constantly changing environment where they're all pressures of different approaches, different measures, they have to be able to, to deal with that and they have to look for different ways. And so we have hundreds of different ways of promoting that. Some people like different aspects of what takes place. Accelerated learning has to do with that whole notion of are our people learning? How do you develop expertise? How do you develop talent? How do you make sure that we're an innovative organization? Project-centric, we try to do things that are geared towards the challenges and the problems that we have. There's a work that was published a few years back by Daniel Kahneman called Thinking Fast and Slow. It's a book that I would recommend for anybody in a systems field or in a project field because it talks about all the different thought and cognitive biases that get in the way of success. Decision making is a key part of being successful in terms of a project. This is a model, again, you can go to, that, to the PMI site in terms of NASA real knowledge. And again, there's about a 60 page description. But we need to look at things from the standpoint of the total organization. What's the challenge? What's the mission? What's the vision that the leadership is setting out? If we don't do that right, we will fail. Doesn't matter all the other tools. I had a leader who came up to me saying they're frustrated because the project that they're looking at wasn't learning. I said, is learning part of the outcomes that you expect? Well, no, it's not written down. Then we're not going to focus on that. The outcomes really say a lot to what we're looking at. A lot of success and learning happens at the team. We spend time focused on team development, extensive amount of resources, how do we work together, including with our international partners where we spend over a week together, learning each other, meeting each other, going through learning. If you're gonna to work together, you should learn together. And then there's also the factor of the political reality, the expectations of society, what are the benefits, what, what are the realizations that are taking place. All of that is within the framework of knowledge. We look at things, uh, again, this is partly what Mark had said. It's key to identify the critical knowledge and then to look at ways of capturing it, to share it, and to discover it. The discovery is circled because that we see as one of our weaknesses. These are some of the big challenges. How do we identify our critical knowledge? How do we share it? How do we learn? We have processes. This looks complex, but basically I will meet two times a year with the senior organizations and they'll tell me what they're worried about. They'll tell me about project failures, about mistakes, about project reviews. And from that, we will identify a one-page chart or a diagram. You can't read this, but you can go to km.ns and you can see that. Four areas that we worry about. People, process, knowledge transfer learning, and technical expertise. And there are issues within that uh, measured by addressing those. We don't want the same issues to be there year in, year out. This is about a 22-page report. My management doesn't read, you know, so they want visuals. So I try to get everything in one page. Final tips before I close. So it's a complex world. It's a project world. It's an entrepreneurial world. We need to give our people and our practitioners the ability to be successful. Think about establishing an academy. We need to feed our people an understanding of attitude, have senior leaders like you do here talk about the vision, talk about how to work together, talk about the importance of innovation to create the values that we're looking for. Create assignments so that people are learning by doing. You learn best by working with others. We will appoint people to work as deputies to different people who are very effective. You learn by doing. Knowledge is about people, communications, telling stories, coming together in events like this. Alliances, networks, Knowledge is about systems that allow us to identify what's critical, 
and for our local organizations and projects come up with the talented and the approaches that are successful for us. And I'd also say we need to keep in mind the young professionals. For us, we define it as 35 years old and younger. They think differently, they learn differently, they use new technologies. And so I'll meet with them and I'll tell them, tell me what we need to do. And they look for different structures. The final thing I'm going to show you is I believe in my 32 years that there is a sound of successful project leadership. There's a sound of a successful project. It's discussions, it's energy, it's laughter, it's walking around, it's conversation and collaboration. And when you see it at the very end of the team, I know you had Brian, your head colleague and a friend last year, talk about the seven minutes. I'm gonna close this down with about 30 seconds of what the sound of success looks like from a team that has had success. towards a great vision changing society. This is also learning and knowledge when it comes together. This is the sound of success. I've been very fortunate to spend the last week here in Dubai, very grateful. I've met old, I've reestablished old acquaintances, met new friends, and I wish you continued success as you improve and change society through your visionary leadership, through the passion that you have and what you do and through the courage to take on very challenging, grand challenges and projects. And I hope to, to say, see you again soon. Shokran, thank you.